on behalf of uh, Dean Deborah McPhee, who had to be up at the Bronx campus, I wanted to welcome you all and to um, thank the people who made this happen. And the people who made this happen are um, the volunteers, the current students who have formed um, a new group here at the Lincoln Center campus, the Student Congress. And I particularly want to shout out, you're going to meet Tessa Engel in a minute, because she's going to be the moderator of our distinguished panel. But um, Tessa Engel over there, and Liz Manis over here, and Hannah Babis over there, are the, the three students who really um, pulled this together, um, in addition to um, other volunteers from the student body. Um, and we're just so proud. And, and I've had the real honor, I have to say, of acting as an advisor um, to the uh, Student Congress in formation this year. And it, is, it has been my privilege to work with these students who have shown so much energy and initiative in doing um, something like this. Uh, they did a Thanksgiving um, book drive for children um, uh, right before Thanksgiving, uh, which was very successful. And they're going to be doing a toiletry drive for um, uh, families living in a homeless shelter uh, run by Henry Street Settlement. And when is that going to happen, Liz? In the next few weeks. <laughs> in the next few weeks. OK. And, and, uh, and they have another. <laughs> and they have another couple of events uh, planned for the spring uh, that is are, are trying to create um, a sense of community among the students here. And I applaud you all for your effort to do that. Just want to recognize um, some folks uh, before Tessa does her moderating. Um, dean Linda White Ryan, who is the Dean for Student Services, who has been unendingly supportive of um, this effort, uh, and Dean Elaine Congress, both here. Um, uh, we have a, a faculty member, Samina Azar, over there. Thank you, Samina, for supporting. Um, you know, the first time you do something, it's always um, a pilot project. But uh, we have a terrific panel. Um, uh, unfortunately, we had a last minute emergency cancellation of our third panelist. But nevertheless, these two can hold the fort down, I think, uh, pretty well. Um, so without that, uh, thanks again for coming. Um, welcome to the Graduate School of Social Service. And Tessa, it's all yours. So thank you again for, for, the, for everyone who's here tonight. Um, and we are thrilled to have with us tonight these two professors who are experts in the field of immigration and mental health. Um, and speaking on behalf of all of GSS Student Congress, we feel that it is imperative that as students of social work at a Jesuit institution like Fordham, it is our obligation to develop a deeper understanding of the implications of immigration and mental health at the micro, meso, meso and macro levels. In a sanctuary city as diverse as New York, and with a current administration whose policies are shifting on a regular basis, we must stay informed of and sensitive to the multiplicity of issues that migrants in New York City at the national level and from a global perspective are forced to confront. Um, from a personal perspective, I have my current field placement at the International Rescue Committee working with immigrants um, on a daily basis at, at a, more of a clinical level. And I also have volunteer experience with New Sanctuary Coalition and the Young Center. And I'm always grappling to understand my role as a social worker in terms of clinical policy and advocacy efforts. Um, so tonight, I'm looking forward to, to this being an informative educational experience for everyone. Um, and Nancy had a great introduction. But this is the first panel of the semester that's been organized by GSS Student Congress. And we are looking forward to planning more events. So if you are a current student who's interested in finding out more about Student Congress and getting involved, we have pamphlets or flyers out at the table on the uh, outside. And um, also feel free to speak with any of the current um, Student Congress members who are here tonight. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our two panelists. Um, Dr. Marciana Popescu is Associate Professor at Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service. Dr. Popescu 
worked in international development and studied various aspects of the field since 1995. She conducted study tours with students in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, focusing on immigration rights violations, statelessness, post-disaster displacement, and forced migration. In 2006, she was awarded a Fulbright scholarship and spent five months in Austria and Europe studying migration policies and their impact on refugees in general and women asylum seekers and refugees in particular. And in 2018, she received the Fulbright Specialist Award uh, for 2018 to 2021. In 2018, she was also awarded a Social Innovation Fellowship for conducting research on the role of higher education institutions in addressing migration challenges. She continues her focus on migration with three added studies. Implementation of the two global compacts on safe migration and refugees, the effectiveness and utilization of healthcare networks by asylum seekers, and entrepreneurship among women asylum seekers and refugees. And Dr. Gregory Acevedo is an associate professor of social work at Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service. Much of Dr. Acevedo's work has focused on the transnational connections and political, economic, and sociocultural well-being of Puerto Ricans and Latinx groups in the United States. Dr. Acevedo's scholarly work is interested in policy debates regarding social problems such as poverty and global migration and those related to globalization and neoliberalism. His work underscores how macro-level issues manifest themselves at the level of community, particularly um, communities that have, been, have experienced long-standing marginalization. These macro-level issues have profound implications for the social and economic well-being of Latinx communities and the nature of social work practice. Okay, so um, both of you have a unique and varied experience on working and teaching in the field of immigration. And how have you seen mental health issues emerge in your fields, especially in recent years? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, I, as I was thinking about this, um, first thing that came to mind is obviously immigration is always involved stressors that relate to mental health and well-being. So I don't think that that's new. I think what's new is really that in recent years there's been basically a perfect storm, if you will, um, in terms of a spike in nativism, a uh, rise of populist nationalism, and an increase in hawkish foreign policy. Uh, I think those things coming together really at this moment have uh, made the uh, context uh, for how um, the realities of immigration as a, a stressful uh, kind of uh, uh, human experience are much more difficult in this current environment. And I think the um, other thing that seemed to be most different in recent years is the whole issue of the family separation. and. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting having taught attachment theory for now like 25 years uh, that the public came to know this thing called attachment uh, in a much more kind of concrete way through this uh, horrifying experience of family separation. Uh, so I think that's, that's really what I see as being the most recent trends. Mm -hmm. That captures everything, but just to add to this, I think the other element is the, this uh, rhetoric of fear that in the United States, I thought I did. Do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. So it's a rhetoric of fear that in the United States we can see ever since 2001, right? So we talk about 9-11 and uh, the immediate response of the United States and the implications here, but also globally. But it is not only in the United States. We have the same rhetoric of fear that leads to uh, identity issues, um, the politics of identity that are played at different levels that actually contribute more to mental health issues, right, when we're talking about migrants, but not only about migrants. We're dealing with communities that are host communities that are also affected. And as hard as it is for us to understand, they are also dealing with identity issues. So all this climate of fear and otherization and uh, identity politics actually contributed to increased mental health issues, I would say. And can you detail a little bit more specifically some specific factors that are affecting migrants' health and mental health? 
Sure, <laughs> there are multiple factors. So as Greg said, when you're looking at the migration process, migration journey, right? From the country of origin to the country of destination, you know, like people are dealing with loss. Loss of community, loss of family members, loss of history, loss of identity, right? They are leaving and they are leaving in a state of uncertainty. Actually, the definition of forced migration very well captures that because we are dealing with four elements there, right? It's forced, forced, the element of force, it's brutal, okay? So that creates maximum stress. It's uncertain, you know, you might know you would leave. You don't know when. You don't know how. You might think you know where you want to get, but you don't know if you'd ever get there. So that uncertainty actually contributes to extreme levels of stress. And then you expect safety in the place of destination. And what happens when you arrive at JFK and you request asylum? What happens when you arrive in Greece or you are on the Mediterranean? Safety that you expect, the safety that you expect, it is not there. So when you're thinking of all this, the stress mounts, escalates. You're coming with a history of trauma. The migration journey adds to that history of trauma. You get to a country that is not helping you deal with the trauma. And that will only aggravate the issues you are dealing with. Plus, you know, the moment you arrive, there are all these other elements. We're talking in social work about the person in environment, right? For every forced migrant, the context needs to be looked at. Do they have the basic goods that they need to live? Do they have enough knowledge of what happens to the family left behind? You know, that's a, that's a true... What about the guilt, the, the survivor's guilt? They escaped, but they are dealing with this guilt. Do they feel that they are integrated in the society? Are they afraid? Do they see a future? Can they still identify with their past? All these are contribut contributors to, to mental health issues, right? And to a deteriorating state of well-being in general. Yeah, I mean, I think the culture of fear that you talked about uh, and the kind of hypervigilance that it instills, the level of anxiety. I mean, if you look at the researchers and um, the types of mental uh, issues that they identify, depression, anxiety, et cetera, um, these things are made worse. Um, the idea that you talked about identity and also this issue of identification with uh, um, your home country and with um, your new home. Uh, host country, if you will, um, the feelings of persecution, surveillance, um, the lack of sympathy that's expressed for your concrete reality. Uh, I think those are things that make it worse as well. And I think there's um, real concrete um, barriers in terms of the mental health system. I was really sad that our, our, our panelists from New York Immigration Coalition couldn't be here because that report uh, that they recently put out, I think, was really the most comprehensive report I've seen in terms of the current era under uh, the Trump administration and the um, kind of effect that it's had on the uh, mental health um, for immigrants and refugees. So I think, you know, there's everything from the uh, system itself, access to interpreters, uh, culturally, however you, whatever your current preference is, cultural competent care, culturally syntonic care, cultural humility, um, but some understanding of culture, obviously. Um, issues around racial and ethnic identity related to that in the context of home versus here. I think all of those things also um, are playing into it. Um, and something I guess I'll, I'll save a little bit later, which is really just, um, the implications of um, what's been an increasingly hollowed out welfare state, mm -hmm. which began well before this. I mean, we could basically go to Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan for that, um, and really hasn't been slowed down by administrations, whether they be Clinton or Obama. So I think that's part of what's made it worse. And just to build on that, because when you're talking about, I'm just bringing, bringing the issue here, right? We are in the United States. We can basically use three dimensions to look at what are the factors that are contributing? What are, what are the challenges for mental health care for forced migrants, right? And I group them in three, under three major dimensions. First, availability. Um, do they have available services, as you said? For a million of reasons, they don't. Uh, so when we talk about services for forced migrants, any kind of health care should be trauma, any kind of care, 
any kind of service should be trauma-informed. There is not enough trauma-informed care. And that's something that we should bring back when we talk about implications for social work. Mm -hmm. What about trained professionals? Professionals that understand not only the health and mental health care aspects, but also the migration aspects, and can talk about the intersection of the two. Uh, referrals, you know, are, do we have a solid system of referrals? What studies show is that only 3% of the asylum seekers are actually referred for mental health services after their initial screening, 3%. There is ongoing trauma. That doesn't mean that that trauma uh, renders them inactive or, or with major you know, mental illnesses. No. But that needs to be addressed and somehow it's not even depicted. The second dimension is access. Okay, so here we're talking about all kinds of barriers. Language, information. Uh, do they understand what services are available? They know. Do, do we provide that information where and how? Uh, what about the U.S. healthcare system? That's hard to navigate for U.S. people. And we are expecting a group of people that are coming here with no knowledge of the system to be able to access it by themselves. Insurance, the entire insurance system. Uh, transportation, can they get from A to B? We take it for granted. But I talked to some of the asylum seekers in New York that have difficulty using the subway system, right? So that in itself needs to be thought of. And cost, of course, costs are prohibitive. And we're talking about, yes, there are benefits that are available to them at little to no cost, but do they know about that? In most cases, they still have some costs, right? Um, and the third dimension is utilization. Let's say we dealt with all the availability issues and we removed all the barriers. Will people use the services? And here we are talking about the sense of safety. If you are telling me to go to the hospital, but the hospital doesn't make me feel safe, I will not go there. If I'm afraid that the ICE agents will be waiting for me as I go into the hospital or as I come out, will I go? No. Right? So the sense of safety actually contributes to the lack of or, or low utilization of services. Stigma. Do I go there to talk about what? You know, there are people that have it much worse than me. And then if it is a mental health issue, that comes with stigma attached. So what would people think of me? How would I be labeled? Why would I need help? Am I weak? And I would say one of the utilization barriers that is extremely important that we don't talk about is resilience. This idea that it's true. I mean, migrants are some of the most resilient people but sometimes that goes against them because they feel they have to be strong. So they will not access services even when those services are available. So this is just to get us started, but these are the dimensions of challenge when we're talking about accessing any kind of services, but accessing mental health care services in particular for forced migrants. Thank you. Um, so both of you have experience um, working and studying immigration in Latin America and Dr. Pavescu in Europe as well. So I'm curious to know how different migrant groups have been affected differently by migration policies here in the U.S. and, and globally, and which are some of the groups that are left out, and, and how do women and children have a different experience than other people? Well, I think one thing for me has always been the Puerto Rican experience, so that uh, we don't cross international boundaries again. But of course, you know, many uh, people in the United States just discovered that we're actually citizens and that it's actually U.S. territory. Um, it's kind of pathetic. The uh, recent governor of Puerto Rico, Rosselló, um, when he was making a plea for aid after the uh, hurricane, and in the midst of the financial debacle, I was like, you know, um, we need to make Americans aware that these are U.S. citizens. Um, well, you know, that's been since 1917. So I guess I have to question the hollowness of that um, kind of a philosophy. So, you know, I hear what you're saying about forced migration, clearly, but uh, even those who aren't forced migrants per se, uh, who don't cross international borders, um, are clearly um, subject to many of these same conditions. Um, you know, it's interesting, my mom's 81, and over the last few years, she's been told, why don't you go back to where you come from, much more repeatedly than when she first came. So she's always told me about those experiences coming as a 16-year-old girl. Um, but yeah, so it's a constant thread. Again, I think that's one thing I want to underscore tonight is that uh, we're seeing an amplification of dynamics that have been in play for a long time. Uh, we're just in an era where they're kind of almost hyper real at this point. 
Um, so I think that's part of it. I think obviously, you know, you have uh, what people, of course, call push and pull factors, and those differ clearly in terms of the context of whatever nation state you might be um, migrating from. And so um, there are clear geopolitical influences, uh, aspects of violence, um, all of that, uh, long records. You know, I think the one thread that's always clear in Latin America and the Caribbean is uh, the legacies of colonialism. I always cite uh, Juan Gonzalez's book, Harvest of Empire, uh, in which he basically tells the story about, you know, America's an empire. Um, and it's reaped its harvest. Its harvest is its colonial footprint throughout Latin America. I was just today at a talk at the law school here at Fordham, sponsored by, I guess it was the Center for Race, uh, Law, and Justice. And it was an author talking about, um, it was a book about Puerto Rico, so I was naturally there. Uh, and it was called Almost Citizens. Um, and it was basically telling the story of Puerto Rican uh, second-class citizenship. Uh, and clearly, uh, it's a colony. And part of the whole discussion that he had was um, our inability to see us as an ourselves as an imperial power, because that seems to short-circuit our deep-seated belief that we are this revolutionary democratic project. Um, and I think that's also part of the the issues in Latin America is um, it's been our backyard of foreign policy, probably more so than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some differences between the way in which Europe responded to the migration crisis. And every chance I get, I remind people that migration is not a crisis. Maybe the response of the state governments that should be able to respond to it is a crisis. Migration is not new. It happened all along. Europe responded somewhat differently, but not as different as I would have liked to be able to say. Um, you, you asked what, how different groups fare differently. And one thing that I keep thinking about and keeps me up at night is children. You know, over half of the displaced population worldwide is children. In the United States, both when you look at refugee statistics and asylum, seeking, asylum seeker statistics, you see that we have a very young population, right? But when I'm thinking of children in the context of forced migration and mental health, I'm really worried that we are dealing with generations of children that only knew conflict, death, migration, or all of the above, their entire life. So they moved from a community that was under attack, they went through a journey where they were abused or they were, and or they saw their parents being abused. Uh, they were married, uh, child marriage is used as a protective factor, very, factor, factor very much now for migrants from Middle East, mostly from Syria, but not only, that are traveling, trying to get into Europe, why? Because, you know, it is seen as better if the girl can travel with a man that she's attached to that will protect her. So we're seeing all these things. Um, children are going through trauma after trauma after trauma, then they arrive to places that are not welcoming them and they don't feel at home. And we are not dealing with the trauma they went through. So this will be adults that we will depend on, that we will expect to be productive members of society, but no one really starts talking seriously about what is happening to children, okay? So that's one group that I feel <coughs> is in a way forgotten. Teenagers, they are still children. When I was in 2016, when I was in Europe, uh, I spent some time in Greece and I went to one of the refugee camps there. And actually this is one of the stories I wanted to share with you today. While there <coughs> at the refugee camp, I you know, interviewed a, series, like a group of volunteers that were working with people in the camps. Uh, there was a large population of children and teens at the camp, right? Which is not unusual. Um, there was almost nothing for them to do. Now you have to think of the context. You have forced migrants, most of them were either Syrian or Kurdish. They were at the camp, they were waiting, thinking that they will only have to wait for a very limited amount of time. They did not speak the language. So let's say, you know, the schools will let them in, although that's not the case. But let's say the schools let them in, they don't speak the language. So they cannot really be in the school, and they think it's a limited temporary situation, so they stay at the camps. There is some limited training at the camps, but that's limited. They do chores, but how many chores can you do? So they are spending their days just thinking, you know, and overthinking what is happening, right? And not seeing a future. So in this context, there was a group of girls that the volunteers were working with uh, between 12 and 17, 18 years old. 
Um, and, you know, they were having all kinds of activities. They were visioning and talking about the future. The volunteers tried to work with them as much as they could. And one of the international organizations present there decided, you know what, we can enroll you in a marathon. Oh, that's great. That gives them a purpose. They, that gives them a motivation. So everyone was happy. Both boys and girls were supposed to participate in the marathon. They started training. All of a sudden, they saw hope. And you know, I'm, at the time, my daughter was 16, my youngest daughter, so I could really see how important it is for them to feel they have a purpose. I could see it firsthand. And there we are, and one week before the marathon, they get the kits for the marathon, and they are not enough kits. Now, what do you think the decision was? We'll have only boys participating in the marathon this time, and we'll try to reschedule it for the girls. So here you are. All the girls are upset. Some are crying, some are angry. There is no specialized professional to work with them, right? Because that's the reality. And you have the volunteers trying to do their best, and one of them starts asking them, to, again, to vision. What do you think you'll be five years from now? Where do you think you'll be? And this 16-year-old has a total meltdown and starts screaming and crying and says, we'll be nothing. All we are is refugees. Stop talking about the future. There is no future. That moment broke my heart because there was so much deep-seated trauma in those few sentences that she uttered. It wasn't the normal anger of a teen. It was the total feeling of hopelessness. You know, like I lost everything. I have nothing. Stop talking to me. Right? So when I talk about children and girls, we're seeing this. You come to the United States. Actually, a few years ago now, I think it was in 2011, that uh, Human Rights First uh, issued a report that looked at the situation in detention centers. And by the way, we managed to develop the largest immigration detention center in the world. We did it. The problem is that the migration pattern somehow changed. And also our easiness in throwing people in, in jails, basically, increased. So you have detention centers and you have women being placed in detention centers with little to no access to any kind of mental, any kind of health care, but more specifically, any kind of mental health care services. Not only that, but in the process, they come here expecting safety and they are re-traumatized, re-victimized, strip searched, put in a uniform. Oh, now we are not doing uniform anymore, okay. We solved that part, but did we really? And then some come with mental health needs. They have medication that is not given to them. Guards in the detention centers are you know, using their time trying to make sure that people understand that they should have been better staying in their countries. You hear this. You have stories that are actually telling this kind, showing us, sharing with us this kind of narrative. So these are the groups that are extremely vulnerable that we need to think of. What happens when they come out of there? You know, I, I worked with a few cases in which people opted to go back because they had enough for, of being imprisoned when they came to this land thinking that they will be able to exercise their right, request asylum, and have their day in court. At least that, right? And then you have very specific population. We talk about the LGBTQ population, and here I wish I could pull Tanzilia in to talk a little bit about that. But, uh, you know, it's another layer of oppression. You come here because you were not, your identity was not accepted, and you knew you would lose everything, including your life, if you stay in your country. But you come here, and you don't want to lose your community, so you still want to be connected with your community. So you live with multiple identities, right? So these are groups that we need to make sure have access to all kinds of services that they need in order to increase their well-being. Um, so thank you for sharing both of those stories. Um, so I would like to kind of switch a little bit and think about this topic in terms of the field of social work um, and specifically what kind of response we need at the social work level, what it has been, are there gaps, is it adequate, inadequate? Um, if you could speak about that a little bit. Um, well, I mean, you know, the case for why it's relevant, I think is fairly easy to make, obviously. Yeah. Matters of justice and well-being, that's what we're about. 
Um, I think, and I like what you said, you know, global human migration is not a crisis, it's, it just is, right? Um, but it has increased, and in a world of increased human migration, um, then I think uh, it calls on a, uh, a response um, from professions like ours, and I always like to think that we'd be at the uh, forefront of a response to these kinds of uh, new realities, I guess. And then I think another is that the implications for the welfare state, so that, um, you know, they're not perfect, but Scandinavian welfare models are probably the best thing we have going. Uh, as an example of a welfare state, and those are now being undermined by global human uh, you know, migration. And we see rise of right-wing parties mm -hmm. in places like even Sweden. Um, and clearly it becomes then a Trojan horse, if you will, a way to dismantle the welfare state as a universal provider of benefits and services by right. Um, and so I think we need to um, really kind of counteract that, that movement. Um, and it's happening here as well. Uh, I think for me, it actually is proof of why our new curriculum is the right curriculum, because social work's response has to be really an integrated practice model. And so I think, you know, this idea of these false um, kinds of domains, if you will, and I know I'm using a word that's actually on the books, but uh, hopefully you know what I mean. They shouldn't be thick wall boundaries between what's clinical, what's policy, what's advocacy, what's research, et cetera. Um, so I think that um, a full response requires an integrated uh, practice response. I go back to actually one of the oldest models I ever learned when I was a practitioner, which is Bromf and Brenner's ecological systems theory, right? Um, in fact, Counseling Today a few years ago did a little piece on working with uh, mental health issues for immigrants and refugees and truly emphasized the importance of the Bromf and Brenner uh, model so that, you know, if you look at clinical, uh, again in quotes, um, as you said, the provision of trauma-informed interventions becomes crucial, right? Um, and I like that issue that you know you have to layer in what we know from uh, our issue, uh, you know, issues and in intersectionality that the most vulnerable um, experience trauma in different ways and in, in many ways and at different levels. Uh, I think in policy and advocacy, we still got to do one of the basics, which is building awareness. Um, in our profession, beyond our profession, et cetera. I think the kinds of things that we do normally in advocacy, participating in amicus briefs, signing petitions, all those things are crucial as well. Um, I think in research it's been, the response has been really about kind of documenting uh, many of the me mental health issues, I mean, it could be as sophisticated as running an odds ratio analysis to say, yeah, no, there's, there's more mental health issues occurring in the context of the current. And then responding to this as a humanitarian crisis, so bringing out the best aspects of, uh, of our international social work in terms of humanitarian aid. And remember, international social work begins at home, right? So um, it's here, it's there. Um, so, I, yeah, I think, I think all of those... Um, uh, it's, a, it's a coordinated response um, and the best, uh, let's say, legacies of our profession, which is that we do one thing, it's called social work. We just do it in different ways. Um, that to me is, is kind of crucial to keep in mind. Um, a few years ago, probably five years or so, I started looking at what do we have in the literature when it comes to social work and migration. And it was extremely little, right? Uh, social work journals had mostly clinical studies with very small samples, mostly qualitative, which are good, uh, but nothing on policy, nothing looking at the wider picture, um, not enough to really push us to action. So I started thinking, where are we? What can we do? Between then and now, we can, say, we can see that there is a lot of movement around this issue and social workers get engaged. But I'm thinking, what can we do to be in the midst of practice? So when I went to Austria, I inquired about the, the governmental migration sector there, right? So they, the government hired about 300,000 people in a country of 8 million uh, that worked directly, the frontline workers, with asylum requests, right? Your asylum officers. And I would have expected that a reasonable number of social workers are between them, right? What I found out was that there were only two requirements 
that you have a high school diploma, that means you can be 19 years old, and you go through a four-week training that no one was able to really share a comprehensive curriculum with us when we asked. And then you make decisions on people's lives. And I wonder, where is the social work? How come we are not represented? So I came back here. I dare you, try to see how many social workers we have in the governmental migration sector. Last year, we went to the border in Arizona, the border with Mexico, and we visited the border patrol office, and we talked to one of the PR people that presented us you know, with what they do. It was very interesting to hear that they are recruiting people with a business degree to work with the border patrol office. And it makes sense, right? Because as he said, if you can catch the money and follow the money, you can follow anything. But it doesn't make sense. Because it is a social work, holistic, systemic, ecosystemic approach that needs to prevail. So my question is, why aren't we there? And some of you might say, we don't want to work there. because OK. But there are systems that can be changed from within, and there are systems that can be changed from outside. So we need to kind of penetrate the systems and bring a different view and challenge the current settings. So I would hope that research in social work starts focusing on what data is needed. What kind of evidence can we produce? Not only looking at how good some programs work, that is important, best practices are important, but also how can we use and produce the data that will make a difference? Migration data is the worst there is. I actually put together some, some numbers for today, but we, we will not do numbers. Um, you know, and you look at that and you're trying to see, okay, we can get a case in point. How many asylum, affirmative asylum granting happened this year? How many cases were defensively granted this year? But you can never look at how many applications and then follow them to see how long did they have to wait? Uh, what happened in the process? Did they have access to legal counseling? No such research is available. Then you're talking about the vulnerable groups. Okay, can we follow vulnerable groups? And now what are the differences between women, children, people from different countries? The information is too limited. That's where social workers can enter with their systems approach. Then I cannot thank Greg enough for mentioning that we are not a si we shouldn't be a siloed profession, but we are, right? We are a profession, we should be a profession that works holistically, not separate the clinical part from the policy part, because it is, or from the research part, because we need the data, we need the evidence to really inform policies, and we need the data we can get from our clinical interventions to make sure they are good to make sure that they are trauma-informed, to make sure that they make a difference. But I would say besides that, besides all these elements that we can look at within the social work curriculum, we also have to position social work interdisciplinary. Who do we need to work with? I mean, we're talking mental health. We need to work in teams with healthcare providers, with lawyers, with educators, with anthropologists, for Pete's sake with business people, because you want to provide entrepreneurial opportunities for women that do not have access to any other kind of employment. That will help their overall well-being increase. That will help with their mental health issues. But we need to start working together. And what I see is that we are withdrawing in the silos, both within the profession and when it comes to other professions. So I hope that we can you know, have such events and then think, where are the other professions? How can we bring them in? How can we start thinking innovatively and work to solve, sol to solve problems that need more than one professional view? Okay, I have to stop. <laughs> okay, so uh, responding to that or similar to that, um, are, in your opinion, do you think that we are preparing social work students to work with migrant populations? And, um, uh, yeah, let's go with that question. What do you think? You are the students. I don't think so. Not enough. Not to the response. Yeah. So that's where, you know, like when you started, you beautifully introduced us as the experts. 
I would say we should have had asylum seekers here because they are the experts. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. And I know we both try to keep ourselves informed and learn as much as we can. But you have people that are living with that. And they could help us help you. The same way, we have to have you tell us. You are in an internship, right? You said you are working with IRC. There are others of you that are working with organizations that are focusing on migration. What do you feel you're missing? What would help you do better? I put myself through an immigration law class last semester just because I felt I need to understand how lawyers think. Right? But why couldn't social workers, all social work students, or at least the ones that are interested, have access to such classes and say, okay, you know, one of my elective should be an immigration law course because that's what I want to do. Or another one should look at trauma-informed care. We have such a course, but you know, it's, it's limited. Okay, but these are, these are the kind of courses that you want to see within the social work curriculum and interdisciplinary. Okay, my dream is that we can have a practicum that brings together a group of students from different disciplines and they are immersed in different situations. They are, you don't even need to travel. You can work with some of the most amazing asylum seekers communities here in New York. And we have some of the organizations and the activists running these communities here with us today. You can work with them, immerse yourself. Then identify one issue as students that you want to resolve and then put together an innovative strategy to address it. And then we can support you to implement it. That, I think, would be amazing because would prepare you to innovatively respond to issues that need a different approach. Whatever we did so far didn't work. We need to start working differently. Yeah, those are great points. I mean, when I got here 15 years ago, I saw there was no course at all on immigrants and refugees. Here go. And so I created a special topics course in the policy uh, an advocacy sequence basically on immigrants and refugees. I'd like to think that that has grown, um, but it's kind of like it sputters. It's here, right? It comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. Uh, I think your other point is is very important that, um, uh, how do I put this without being too provocative? I would hate to see this current wave of a hot topic become yet another vehicle for mercenary kind of social work research uh, and the pursuit of reappointment and tenure. And then, you know, hot topic becomes old topic and we move on to something else. Uh, so it shouldn't be driven by the enterprise of um, presenting at conferences, publishing papers, and getting grant money. Um, but I understand the legitimate pressures to do those kinds of things. But as long as that's what drives us uh, as um, educators in social work, uh, I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical that we're really going to fully embrace this and take this on uh, with the uh, kind of energy that it deserves. So, uh, and then your main point is, is certainly true. We are not the experts. We, if anything, we just might have some resources and opportunities that provide the venues uh, and resources for the true experts to speak for themselves. I'm a big one on that. And I'm also thinking like we are, you mentioned grants and you know, like the misuse of grants and research, but there is a good use of grants. And I'm thinking grants that are informed by the community and are, channel to the community to really produce the data that will support the community. But not only that, like we have a million resources here at Fordham, right? And we don't know about them. We have, you know, the Fordham Law School that has a number of initiatives. And the moment we started asking questions, we were able to penetrate those, right? And we can have some of our students that are now working on advocacy issues with the law school students, which is great, right? But it's very little. If we could do this in a more institutional way, and create a synergy. And that's when we stop looking at the curriculum the way we did. Now, my, I might be a bit more provocative, and this is being recorded, I know. <laughs> and look at it in a way that makes it alive. So you can feel that you are adults that are motivated to be the best professionals you can be. 
And this school facilitates your access to all resources that you need to be that. And in the process, you teach us, and we share with you, and we all learn from the community. I hear you. I tend to be more cynical these days. But I think unless we do that, higher education as we know it will become obsolete. So that's a choice. OK. Um, I think you both answered the remaining questions that I had. <laughs> um, so I would like to open it up to the audience to ask questions. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's an old one. Was it boss? Um, it was related to things like um, someone has Alzheimer's. They're physically present, but they're not present. Uh, you haven't lost them in the sense of death, right? They're still there, but they're not all there. Um, and so then that made its way into the migration literature in terms of a clinical uh, kind of a way of thinking about uh, law. I mean, did you lose your whole, your home country or didn't you? You lost it partly, perhaps, maybe totally, or um, you may go back once a year if you can, but what if you can't? Um, so, you know, we process things like loss, um, I don't want to say more efficiently, uh, but when that kind of is, is kind of a, um, a more determinative kind of a reality, but ambiguous loss. I mean, there are many uh, Cuban Americans, for example, in Dade County who won't get past the ambiguous loss until they can actually go home and have an open back and forth with uh, Cuba, right, for example. So um, that's the kind of ambiguous loss uh, as I see it. But, and yeah. then just to add to that, and that's not my area of expertise at all, so I'll just add you know, the element that you know, I struggle with at times is not only you do not feel at home here and you feel that there is something there and you need to go back to really reconnect and find your identity, but when you do go back, you don't find what you left there because everything changed. So you go through another level of loss, right? Uh, and I think this applies to all immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself, but it is much more forceful for people that were forced out of their communities, that lost members of their families, that came here and had to reinvent themselves because everything they knew about themselves, their roles, their skills, their life was redefined and was completely lost in the process. And now here they are building a different life and they want to go back. And when they go back, they don't feel they belong. So I think that in itself creates layers of trauma. Uh, hi, my name is Maria, and um, uh, I represent an organization that supports asylum seekers in New York, and I'm uh, um, a, social, a social worker, <laughs> former student, and uh, you know, I really want to encourage social, social workers. I think this is the amazing liberty and freedom that we have, which is to create new uh, solutions to problem as we see them and not to be afraid of them and not to care about the silos or this one. So let me take an example uh, for us. We saw that was already, you know, you see I have gray hair now, but that was ab about almost 15 years ago. We saw in New York that there's a total lack of void of orientation for arriving asylum seekers on the asylum process, on the very complex legal process of it, and what happened as a result? That was the worst, is that they were getting abused and scammed. It's still happening, but we said, what can we do? Because we saw also, as social workers, as clinical social worker, that people were very depressed. Now, you know, that they thought they were gonna be able to be reunited with their families. They are now in a very long, um, you know, court process. So we said, what can we do? We are social workers. And so we created a whole legal orientation process. And we're very happy now that New Sanctuary has built yes. another step, which is that, you know, pro se clinic, which is drawing so many people. But I call this a psychosocial response. Yes. Whether, you know, I mean, I remember when I was in clinical social work school, they would say, 
Are you, are you, I mean, are you a therapy? I mean, you're not doing therapy. You are not, you, you, why, we're, you know, you are, are you a caseworker? I mean, it was so stupid. You know, the issue was how do you, what kind of solutions do you find to decrease the current, at least you cannot maybe do something about the past trauma, but if you can do something right now, let's do it. And really, I think it's wonderful that social workers, we can do that. Now, let me take another example. Uh, there's my sitting next to my right, and uh, is Madeleine, and you know, we, and so we work a lot with, with volunteers, with the lawyers. Lawyers have volunteers for the past 15 years giving their time to, for us, which has been wonderful. Then uh, to my right is um, Madeleine. She is, she is a very um, wonderful trauma therapist. She comes at our community meetings and help out anyone because, again, that's what you said, Marcia, the, the, the mental health system here, if you try to refer someone, if you knew even where to refer, it's a nightmare. It will never happen. So forget about it. So we have Madeline coming and trying to talk to anyone and in a way that avoids the stigma and we're not going to go into it. Now, to my left is... The, Tanzalia, <laughs> and Tan Tanzalia is doing an amazing work to connect asylum seekers who are professionals, who are extremely educated, to give hope, to reconnect with the educational system here, with the past identity. Last week we had a community meeting, so many people came because that brings hope. So all I want to say, just forget about all these stuff stupid walls, you know, just all of you as young social workers, to get in there, jump in there, and find out the solution. And I, of course, want to talk about my friend, <laughs> Hector and Nurka, who as Venezuelans, asylum seekers, have done an incredible work to self-organize and advocate and provide. They work night and days. And even their son is here, all working all the time as well. So I just want to say, don't give up. Don't worry about it. Just move. Because as you say, we, we should be at the forefront. And we should not be afraid to say, well, you know, when we hear just uh, this, uh, you know, just go ahead and, and, and do whatever you can. Thank and you. that's a psychosocial response. Thank you. Thank you. And I cannot, you know, say enough how amazing is the work you guys do. I mean, last Friday, there was a packed room uh, that, you know, brought together people that might be interested in going into higher education, and they did not know how to approach that, because that information is not easily available, but it can be made available. And it takes a few good people that could bring the resources together and think outside the box or inside the box, but differently. Uh, hi, my name is Anna. Um, I am a current uh, MSW student. And uh, the question I have for uh, you guys is, um, to your knowledge, do you know how sexual health is being talked about within the immigrant population or the migrant population within the US? <laughs> Not an area I'm familiar with. I would obvious. say. Yeah. I could just try another question. Do you know how reproductive health care is being addressed? <laughs> yeah, period. period. Not yeah. for immigrants in general. Yeah. I think that's a big issue, but thank you, thank you for bringing it up. When you look globally, when we're talking about refugee camps, there are major abuses that are happening. Uh, there was a report that came out in 2000, I would want to say 18, from Greece, where in refugee camps, women were like women that needed to give birth were taken to the hospital. And because the cheapest, easiest, fastest solution was to do a C-section, they were you know, put directly through that without any question or consent included, right? Because if you want to do something else, you might need an interpreter, you might, you know, it's all that. And after a C-section, they were being sent back to the refugee camps where they did not have any running water, definitely not warm water sometimes. So it was quite a complicated issue and it was abusive, right? So reproductive health care becomes a very important issue. How do you even start talking about that? 
where do you start? You know, like we are dealing with different groups of migrants. So when you're having migrants that are here, the second generation, they're going through the school system, you would expect that the school will actually expose them to some sex ed. Well, it depends where the school is and how much money and how much, how many resources are there available for that. And is that an interest for the parents as well as the administration of the school, right? So that's an issue in itself. But when we're talking about asylum seekers, that's where such innovative solutions would be the answer, I would think, because we don't do nearly enough. And then you have people that are coming here with sexual experiences that were deeply traumatizing for them. Um, you all heard about female genital cutting and female genital mutilation, and either they came here to escape it or they came here after they went through the process, and that in itself creates major issues. Uh, healthcare professionals are not educated on how to respond to that, not to the extent to which they should be educated. Uh, many times people are being re-abused in the system. So I would say, challenge to you, take this on and say, okay, I want to work with a group of students and identify a good community-based organization and then start creating a curriculum. I tell you, once this is done, it can be spread uh, it can be disseminated and people will really welcome some access to information, knowing where they can go, what do they need to know, about what, how do they deal with STDs, how do you prevent that, um, what kind of care can you have, all these kind of questions, right? I, I wish I would have a better answer, but that's not an area we're focusing on at all. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel and this is kind of for both of you, but it speaks to what you said before about how you hope that this doesn't become yet another like, like fashionable research topic that just fades away. But I mean, unfortunately, that is the model in academia. You do the fashionable research or you don't get tenure and you don't get the professorship, you don't get paid. So in such a hyper-competitive um, system, I'm curious to know as to you know how you how y'all think that there can be success and continued change in advocacy in a system like that? Ooh, uh, it's gonna be hard uh, because it, the metrics for promotion and tenure become even more restrictive, not more open. They're hardly holistic. We always talk about, what is it, the three pillars, teaching, service, and, well, we used to say scholarship. Now we don't even say that. We just say research, right? So that tells you a lot right there. Um, and it's a lot of lip service for the most part. Um, what it really comes down to is um, more and more so, like I haven't gotten merit pay and I don't know how long, um, because I don't have grant money and I don't have uh, you know, uh, articles in highly indexed peer reviewed journals, right? So um, those kind of issues are gonna drive everything, right? So, um, and many of my colleagues are complicitous in that they don't see any issues with that. They see that as the kind of litmus test of quality and the standard bearer of, of what we should be doing. So um, I wish I had high hopes that we can, you know, I mean, I've got tenure, so I'll say what I want now, right? But I actually said a lot even before I got tenure, um, but I don't know that I would get tenure today partly because I was so frank pre-tenure, but mostly because the metrics have just gotten tired. I mean, I've now had tenure for whatever, how many years. Um, I sit on committees and you know I, I hear the conversations and they become more restrictive, not less restrictive. Um, and then you're groomed in it from the time you hit your doctoral program and you go all the way through. Um, and that's what gets you the laurels, right? And that's what gets you the attention and that's, um, so um, I'll stop there. So can I add a, a slightly different point of view? Thank you for that. That's, that's what happens, and we know that this in the academia it happens. But I think that, and again, I'm tenured, so I can say things now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that when, once we are tenured, we do have an obligation to change things. And that comes with not necessarily curtailing publications, but publishing information that's needed putting out articles that could provide that kind of knowledge and skills and data that is needed 
So you can go to journals and find the information that you need to find that speaks to the issues that you need to address. So when we push for that from the 10-year perspective and say, yes, I will publish, but I will publish articles that make sense for the work that I think is meaningful, then start really looking for grants that will support community university partnerships. Right? Because that's when you bring the university in. We can do that once you're tenured, because you're not that limited in, you know, like, what kind of research you do. Okay, I got here. Now I do the research that I think it's meaningful. And publishing, not only for journals, because now we don't need to only score those numbers, that's not that important. Those have their role when you can really produce the information that is needed in the field. But now publishing for, you know, larger venues starting a blog, uh, working with communities, writing a newsletter for communities. These are kind of like the, the activities that I think we can bring into the mix and make them valuable. Yeah, I think di like digital scholarship, yes. for example, uh, which is, you know, maybe Open access, yeah. uh, departments of communication and media studies are starting to maybe look at um, things like digital uh, projects and digital yes. scholarship uh, as things that have merit. Um, but, you know, and, you know, the good old fashioned book chapter, although I know they're too damn expensive and they, you know, et cetera, but um, I've had more students and colleagues over the years say, I read your book chapter uh, than the peer review journal. And, but, you know, the level of respectability as it's perceived are just not the same. Um, yeah, so. Hi, I'm Nancy. I just would answer the question in a slightly different way. I think some of the best, um, uh, advocacy research, and I call it advocacy research, is done outside the university walls. There are a lot of um, advocacy organizations in town, whether it's the New York Immigration Coalition or Citizens Committee for Children or the Community Service Society. They have, they do probably not peer-reviewed scholarly research, but they do research that tries to move policy. And there are some amazing reports that are prepared by these organizations regularly. So I would say it's a compliment, yes. um, academic research in the university wall, um, but look outside as well for the research that can support policy change and advocacy, because that's what I've seen make a big difference in, in my career. And I would also, Second, Marciana's comment about university community organization partnerships, uh, which I think are also really effective on the ground organizations working with um, participants, whether they are refugees, asylees, immigrants, first, second, or fourth generation. They have the stories, they have the data, and working with researchers, you can put it together and really tell a story, and that's what you know, whether we like it or not, that's what changes policy, yes. telling a story. So There's some impediments to that, though, if I might, you know, just chime in one more time, uh, in that, you know, the, the primacy of quantitative research over qualitative research, the amount of time and energy it does, takes to do something like participatory action research. Um, I think in our doctoral program, you know, quantitative is required, but is qualitative required, or is it maybe just now being required? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's some, um, speed bumps, if you will, on the way to doing the kind. And then, of course, there's what's you know likely to be funded or published, too. So you may do the best kind of most relevant research, but it might not see the light of day as well. So I know I'm sounding really cynical, but um, I, you know, again, um, the ivory tower accusation always it, it hits me because I think it's often quite Just to add one, one, one last thing here, because it's you know, I'm hitting the same walls many times. You know, I'm thinking, okay, what can be changed? And where well, you apply for funding and you don't get it because it's not tailored based on the model that is out there. But I still apply and I'll continue to apply. So uh, for a while, I used to push people to think outside the box. And I will use that in all my, you know, advocacy work. Think outside the box, create outside the box. And one day my husband sent me the picture of a, of a book that he found and loved and wanted me to read. And the book is called Inside the Box, basically challenging us to be innovative within the systems that we have, while also trying to change the systems. So I'm thinking, yes, we are dealing with, and 
I have days when I'm out in the field and traveling internationally and doing work there and wondering what am I doing here, right? Because of all these, because you feel like, is, it, is this even meaningful? But then I come back and I think we need to somehow work with what we have and change it. Uh, if, if the research that's valued is not meaningful, bring in work on as much as we can on research that's meaningful and change the discourse, you know? Um, I think it's hard, but you know what? We need to do it. And you know what else we can do? And I challenge you to do that. Work with you. You should be at the forefront. You should go, and I, I don't tell you enough, like you should go at conferences and be the voice out there. You should be, you know, I, I love to publish with students because I think you need these publications because you have amazing ideas and you are doing amazing work. And I learn from each of you. So that's another way to kind of change the system from within. And I'll shut up now. Okay, so my question is, what can the university administration do to support the mental health of these marginalized groups who are navigating academia for the first time? Ooh. Wow, that's so good. I'll try a question. I'll try to answer this because we are now currently working on a study that's uh, really focusing on challenges in the higher education institutions for asylum seekers that are studying here. And actually, the first change that was achieved was through the students' work, not through my research. So all the doctorate, you know, and the, like the letters after my name did not matter. It was really the students' work that, you know, started identifying issues that they were dealing with and then worked with the theater department and created stories based on their stories, right? So they created composite narratives and then they presented one of these narratives to the Office of Development. And it was about healthcare and not being able to access health, to, to, to buy healthcare insurance as an international student because as an asylum seeker, you are not here as an international student. That happened last year in the summer. By fall, all students at Fordham that are somehow not you know, under a particular status can access the, the same type of insurance. So that's a step forward. Now the other part, I would say, I would really love to see the social work school more engaged in creating some sort of a lab and really influencing what is done in terms of mental health access, you know, and the, the kind of treatment that you receive, the kind of, you know, counseling that you can have access to. So one of the students actually shared with us the fact that she called. Uh, now there is a call screening, phone, phone screening. She called and in a 15 minutes conversation, she, has to, she had to share all her life. She was not an asylum seeker. However, she had some major issues that she was dealing with. And after 15 minutes, the person at the other end of the line told her, it's OK, we can give you an appointment in five weeks. Now, there is a problem with that. And to have such a big social work school on campus that has absolutely no involvement in the mental health counseling, while other schools are having labs, and they are providing services, and they are working. It's, it's not like having a student that doesn't understand the process, but you have doctorate students, you have, you have professors that could supervise, you have practitioners that we can bring in and have the true connection with the community and the field. So I think that's one thing that if administration would support, that would be amazing. How we get them to do that, not sure. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment on something that you brought up about the research. And I think looking to other uh, disciplines is really important. Dr. Popescu mentioned interprofessional practice. We need the other professions. Many of the other professions now have moved, yes. I don't want to say totally past. I know that in academia, we are accused of writing for other academics rather than for practitioners that can apply. But a lot of the other professions now are moving in the way of transla translational research mm -hmm. that is being done so that the whole fields um, can uh, apply what, the, what is being written about. So I think looking to the other professions, in social work I noticed, I came to social work from another profession, from nursing. So, and I was attracted to social work because of interprofessional practice. And I think that we don't do enough of it in looking to working and collaborating for the good of, of people with the other professions. I think, I can't say enough about it that I think this is 
really important in the future of our profession moving forward. Uh, I have like two very specific questions and Professor Profeski already uh, answered one of them. Uh, my question is around, uh, so I'm a doctoral student and I work on stress interventions in the hospitals and one of the things that stood out for me was about trauma. And uh, Professor Acevedo talked about how trauma is an ambiguous loss and so my curiosity is around how do you handle something like uh, ambiguous loss, like how do you create an intervention program or what do we do at an individual level and at a group level? Because with stress we can work at an individual level, give people mindfulness apps. That doesn't work. <laughs> but then at a group level, how do you address things like trauma? And then it, of course, with immigration, the intergenerational trauma of it. So that was one of my questions. And my second question is around, oh, I think one of the students already asked the question around mental health. So with trauma, if it goes unaddressed, we often talk about trauma-informed practices in social work. How do we do that with immigrants? Because I think it's a different need the source of trauma is very different for sources of trauma with other clients that we are working with, especially with immigrants. So what is that one source of trauma that we can account for when we're looking at trauma-informed practices with social work? So those are my two questions. Well, I think that's not a question I can answer. I'd actually turn it over to the experts in the with field trauma. actually doing it. Um, my last time in the field as a uh, clinician was probably 1996. Um, Although I was, you know, before the term trauma came up, was clearly cognizant of the fact that it was a, a realistic issue in, in work with uh, clients. But um, that's not, you know, I'm not a direct practitioner and I don't teach in the, um, what do we call the domain now? Uh, individuals and families. So I think like one important element, I'm not a practitioner either, but uh, I had the opportunity and privilege to be the director of evaluation for the National Trauma Center that we have here. So I got to learn by, by evaluating and to know what to evaluate. Uh, I, I would say the first thing that I would like to clarify is ambiguous loss is not trauma. It's one element that you need to consider when you do trauma assessment, right? So how do you do that? There are all kinds of techniques through which you do that. But before that, because for that you need very specialized, and we have multiple manualized trainings that I don't necessarily agree with, mostly when you're dealing with collective trauma, and you mentioned that. So when you're working with refugees or with displacement or with natural disasters, that's an element of collective trauma. And there is an entire literature talking about how you need, what skills do you need to work with a group rather than with an individual when it comes to trauma. Now, there are some commonalities, and that goes back to trauma-informed care. So trauma-informed care in the plainest, plainest language goes back to cultural sensitivity and to starting by admitting that you don't know and to not making assumptions but allowing the people that are talking to you to share their story as much as they want. Now the manualized treatments and all other literature on trauma will give you other more specific ways to actually facilitate the narration. There is a whole narrative framework approach that is being used in practice and in research and in policy, by the way. Uh, but you can start by realizing that everybody should step back from the person at the front desk. That's what trauma-informed care is about. You're not focusing on the, on the, only on the therapist. That is where the highly specialized intervention comes in that neither Greg nor I could ever talk about because we're not trained in that, right? But besides that, every single person needs to be trained to look at the person as a person, to allow them to share as much they want, to make them feel safe. Now, if you step back and you start thinking what makes you feel safe, it will help you a little bit. Because sometimes the most silly things we do is we raise a wall through the first hello we, tell, we, we use with a person or through asking questions that we shouldn't ask. And actually, just expanding from this question of yours, um, I wanted to also talk about the, the importance of, of having trauma-informed training, training on trauma-informed care in higher education institutions for teachers, right? Because you, we are working with students that come to our classes with their stories. And among the stories that the students that we worked with collected, there was one of a student that shared her experience. It was based on her story. An, act, an actor actually presented the story to us. 
that came to Fordham and somehow shared with one of the professors the fact that she is an asylum seeker. And that professor, bless his or her heart, thought, that's great, I will support her and I will help her not be invisible, but that's not what the student wanted. So every class, the professor will teach and will talk about different aspects of forced migration and turn to her and say, you should know best, tell us how it is. And she felt extremely targeted and uncomfortable because this was not what she wanted. She wanted to be a student, not an asylum seeker. So I think that is part of being trauma-informed and being migration-informed and being humanity-informed. You know, it's not about us. I have to train myself to step back and think, I love the work that I do. I hate it at times, but it's not about me. It's about how can I contribute to changing policies that are oppressive? What does it take? How can I contribute to give, to, to share with you what I learn so you will learn a little bit more and you will go out and do much more than I can do? And that all starts with being a little bit more sensitive to what we see around us and how we present ourselves to the world. But I'll be happy to send you a number of like articles on, on collective trauma. Okay, uh, thank you for your talk, really informative. So something that, that I've been struggling with is the way that we have been talking about the response to this quote-unquote crisis, right, which tends to put a lot of the, the centered focus on accessing mental health resources, right? And that the nature of how we talk about social work has increasingly become quote-unquote clinical in nature, right, and not political. But the very act of saying, right, that regardless of my race, sex, gender, citizenship status, I should, in this very wealthy country, be able to access care is a political act, right? Yes. And that there are very structural changes that are happening, right, that are making that increasingly impossible, right? The public charge rules, right? So if you're unfamiliar, right, so accessing these resources can now be to your detriment to being able to get citizenship, right, or even legal status through a green card or uh, a longer term visa, right? So, um, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, action on the nonprofit front, which is fantastic, but it's contributing very much to, I think, what, what Greg referred to, right, the sort of weakening of the welfare state. And, you know, we live in really at the heart of it, right, a capitalist empire, right, that is going to be charging per hour for billable mental health sessions. As an LCSW, I'm very aware of this, right? I could be making more money as a therapist in New York City than as an academic. That's reality. It's a shame, but it's true, right? So, so I'm, I, I'm very just struggling with this, right? That of course you want to offer these services, these very needed services, but I think the very mobilization in some ways is contributing, again, to this weakening of the welfare state, right? Because we're saying, government, we don't trust you. We're not gonna do it through you. We're gonna organize amongst ourselves because we can't rely on you. And I feel like that's a response that is really saddening to me as an American citizen. So I don't really know what the question is, but I, yeah, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it made me think of, because um, I brought this, uh, I was reading it this afternoon, so it's a piece from The Guardian from this Monday. Uh, titled, Building Resilience Won't Stop Traumatized Social Workers Quitting. Um, and it's actually a critique of the whole mindfulness uh, kind of movement. Um, and I like what actually a professor of management had to say uh, about this issue of mindfulness and basically that uh, this rush to embrace mindfulness without a political agenda is actually debilitating for our profession. And I'm just gonna quote it just because he says it a hell of a lot better than I would ever say it. The so-called mindfulness revolution meekly accepts the dictates of the marketplace, guided by a therapeutic ethos aimed at enhancing the mental and emotional resilience of individual. It endorses neoliberal assumptions that everyone is free to choose their responses, manage negative emotions, and flourish through various modes of self-care. Framing what they offer in this way, most teachers of mindfulness rule out a curriculum that critically engages with causes of suffering in the structure of power and economic systems of capitalist society. 
there's only so much social workers can take on because there's only so much they can change. The same may be said of those who require services and to an extent employers providing services. While individual groups work to develop resolutions to these problems, they will flounder unless the ideology that underpins their application is exposed and addressed. And I would add to that 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 goes back to not thinking about social work in clinical terms and to not forgetting that we are political. When we say we are not political, it's, it's an illusion even, you know, <laughs> because for whatever, through whatever things we do and we support, we become political. And not forgetting that the state needs to be held responsible. I, my policy students hear this a lot from me, like, <laughs> You know, we're blaming the government. Who is the government? We are a representative democracy, as bad as it functions. So how do we change that from within? And what is my role, you know, from the local level? Okay, let's say I feel totally helpless when it comes to, you know, the White House. But we can really look at what can we do at local level and how do we know what is the government doing about the public charge in the city of New York? You know, um, how, can I, how can we insert ourselves? What are the, the, the actions that we can take? And maybe building our curriculum around such questions will also help. In the process, you know, we will address other issues because when you start thinking politically, you think access, right? When you think access, you think, okay, these barriers need to be removed, which means that people will have better access to healthcare in this case. I want to add something else though. The other thing that is important, and I, that kind of like doesn't let the government off the hook, but brings up a reality that we need to know, to think how to address. Because healthcare is so inaccessible, there are informal healthcare networks that are developed, as you mentioned, right? In which healthcare practitioners are coming together trying to build innovative solutions. I wouldn't want to see those replacing the role of the government, but rather see ways in which the government and other you know, institutions can actually support such initiatives because what we learned is that migrants really trust informal networks much better than they trust the existing healthcare system that is not working for them. So that's the tension right there. How can you do both? I have a question. Um, my name is Rupert and I'm an MSW student in my final semester here at Fordham. Um, in listening to all of um, to what everyone has been saying, all of these challenges that are coming up, and us as social workers, when I know, remember when I first came in um, to Fordham, one of the things that and we were taught is that our role as social workers is supposed to be an advocacy role. We're supposed to be advocating. But one of the things that I know for me personally, in terms of going through this process, I, I don't feel that. Um, our program has done enough in preparing us to be advocates. We kind of gloss over what that really means, and we touch on it here, touch on it there. But this role of advocacy really means rolling up your sleeve and getting your hands dirty. It, and I don't think that as, um, as a program, we have done enough in preparing students. And I think about those who are coming behind me. How is, um, what adjustment do you think needs to be made to really prepare students who are supposed to be advocates um, to be proper, ad, um, to, I guess, practice the proper advocacy approaches as we move forward? What role do you think the department should play? And let's start with GSS here in terms of what role should they play in really informing our stu um, students coming in? in terms of to really carry this mantle? It can't just be one course. Um, <laughs> it mirrors what I was saying about um, tenure in terms of uh, teaching, service, and research, where teaching and service are kind of secondary. And, um, and I often find that uh, advocacy is given a lip service, but it's clearly not as well integrated, well resourced, 
uh, when you get to your placements, it's kind of like shoehorned in, if anything, but not really integral to what we do. Um, we don't really have uh, ongoing, consistent, well-resourced efforts as a school that students can lead, but sometimes you can't lead until you plug into something that's already going, right? Especially if you don't actually have the knowledge and skills and, you know, right, so you need the context for learning. Um, it can't just be in a classroom and obviously has to be incubated outside the classroom. Um, I mean, I guess those are some of the impediments. It, it um, your voice. Right, students have to, when you become alumni, they send out alumni surveys, right? They also want your money, um, but they also want your opinion, right? And one of your opinions that you have to express is, here's what was missing in my uh, education, because nothing's perfect, right? Um, and there are gaps, right? We always talk about gaps. Um, and if that's an identified gap that you have uh, seen, I don't think you're probably the only one. Um, and so your, your voice probably resonates more than, uh, a professor who clearly already believes in it and wants it to happen, but you know, you're going to be much more of a voice, an advocate uh, for the role of advocacy. That's, yeah. Oh, trust me, I will be. That's for sure. <laughs> so another another option that I think again, your voices will help support such initiatives. We have here to that tonight representatives from different community-based organizations and advocacy groups that are doing amazing work. I would want us, we actually talked to Nurka and we are trying, I'm trying to see how we can link the poly, the advocacy projects to the real need that's out there and look, work with the Venezuelan asylum community to see what is needed, you know, and then have students take this on, learn from them and then prepare whatever documents are needed to support their work. We can do the same with Maria, we can do, we can find ways, but it has to be facilitated by the school. Because as Greg said, you know, sometimes one professor will do all these things, but then how many students will have access to it? But if you institutionalize and if we start thinking, okay, how do we make this real? You know, one of the hardest, most annoying question I have to answer is, do we really need to do an advocacy project or can we just pretend? And I feel I'm totally losing it. Because if you just want to pretend, you shouldn't be here. Even if we do the smallest thing, and there are so many, case in point, you have two petitions that you brought here today. After you said that, I looked online, I found at least another five that are relevant for social work input, right? And we can make a difference, start working together, then work across disciplines and, you know, see what the law school is doing. How, how are they doing that? Do we need to have a co-taught course? Do we need to allow the students that are really interested in taking advocacy at the next level to take a course in another school because they will have a better impact, right? These are the kind of changes at the curricular level and at the practice level that you through your voices can support. And we would definitely pioneer those because we are interested in that. But it's hard when you have to do it all by yourself. The other thing is immerse yourself in communities. I cannot say this enough. Immerse yourself in the communities because when you are there, you will be faced with so many questions and you will not, you will be compelled to try to identify what is needed. I don't know enough about that. Let me inform myself. Uh, can I find a translator? And soon you'll find out that there are three of your friends that can speak French and can help you. It's just once you are immersed, you will not be able to turn your back. And we can do it through the school, and you can do it on your own as professionals as well. And I do hope that NASW, through its different structures, will also help you do that and find your niche. Hi, um, my name's Liz. I am looking at this um, handout of how to get involved, and it has some Fordham base, um, let's see, what else does it say? National, I think, and NYC based. And I was wondering, with taking this home, what would be the most effective way to sort of continue with this sheet of paper? So uh, Student Congress put together this resources pamphlet, which is at the door. Um, and I think that I included some organizations that I'm personally involved in. Um, and I think that many of these organizations are asking for volunteers. Um, and especially New Sanctuary Coalition has the accompaniment project, has um, the Pro Se Immigration Clinic at night as well on Wednesday nights. Um, and 
they're also looking, you know, for students and people to get involved in um, marches and protests and rallies and to donate money as well. So I think that those are some ways that we can, you know, walk out these out of these doors and do something tonight that's actionable. Um, but I don't know if either of you have any other opinions on that. That all sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, underscoring Margiana's point, I just get out there and be in yeah. community. There's got to be a million and one ways to serve and to do from small to large. Um, and every little aspect of that um, will help. So um, from the petition and beyond. But. Mm -hmm. Can I actually ask, because I want to leave you with the challenge, right? So if you want to just close your eyes and listen to me. I'll share with you a story. We were at the border in Arizona. And there was this one family, a father, the mother, and their five children. Children were small, and the girls, three of them were girls, were extremely attached to the father. At the time we met them, they were standing in line for food. They were already there for three weeks. They came all the way from Guerrero in Mexico. They were an indigenous group that were threatened by the cartels. And we were trying to witnessing, to witness and see what their story is. And the father told me, I'm really concerned. I left to protect my daughters. But what if when we get to the border, they throw me in jail. What if they separate me from them? Do I hurt them more than I help them? What can you do to guide me so I know what to do? Now I want you to think as a social worker, what questions will you have? What will you need to know? Where will you start? Do you know that there is a new law that basically prevents people from even stepping in the United States to apply for what is an international human right, asylum. Do you know that three countries signed, were forced to sign economic, excuse me, bilateral agreements with the United States and now they are safe third countries? Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Do you know what that means? And if you don't, where will you start to help this one family? What can you do? That's what I want to leave you with. Because it's real, and it's raw, and it haunts me. I could not find any answer for him. But I hope you can. Any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you to Dr. Acevedo and Dr. Popescu for speaking tonight, and thank you for all in attendance. Um, once again, we have resources pamphlets out uh, on the table, a pamphlet about Student Congress and getting involved, and two petitions on the computers for you to sign before you leave today. Um, so thank you again, and we in, uh, at Student Congress look forward to continuing this conversation that we've started tonight. Thank you.